I'm going to read uh, uh, the present part of this paper and then pass the buck on to Tunika because my eyes are not very well, I'm not quite okay yet. My paper will be in three parts. I begin by a very broad sketch of the development of social history in India. Then, uh, with a special focus on some of the features of nationalist, Marxist, and subaltern studies, modes of writing. Uh, next, I review some rather in some particularly interesting developments in modern Indian social history in the field of labor history, urban labor history. Finally, I turn to a bit of my own work and take the liberty of presenting a bit of that before you, for your comments and criticisms. But first, a little about the title of my paper. Is a Marxian social history of modern India possible? This title immediately raises two kinds of questions. One, why am I using and in what sense am I using the term social history? And what do I mean precisely? What kind of Marxian history I'm talking about? Because Marxian history, of course, has been of many varieties, with many kinds. Uh, social is a term that attracts me because I think it conveys, best of all, a sense of totality, an effort to link, sorry, a sense of totality, an effort to link the many aspects of human life to emphasize the interconnections between them and in the process of emphasizing interconnections also highlight the contradictions. Both are very important. Uh, unlike certain, uh, some other terms like say political history or economic history which compartmentalize inevitably by their very terms uh, the various spheres of life, social is ambitious enough to try for a totality. Just a here. Totality, however, we must, I must add immediately, I think can be, of, can be and has been of two kinds. By totality, historians, some historians have attempted literally to try to link together all spheres of life in a particular period or a period or in a particular area. But perhaps on the whole a more fruitful way of approaching totality is through a small unit, taking a particular incident or a small period, but looking at it, analyzing it in as multifaceted a manner as possible. I would suggest that E.P. Thompson offers excellent examples of both kinds of totality. His making of the English working class is of course a classic instance of an effort, a brilliant effort, to bring together the developments in labor history in the period in, uh, in Britain, in England, from the late 18th and early 19th century. But the same Thompson wrote, among many other things, a brilliant essay uh, situating and analyzing during a close reading of William Blake's poem, London. Taking up the evolution of this notion of totality, I didn't tell this audience, of course, in any detail, that it has gone through many phases. Two major developments have been the Anal School, which emphasized geographical and demographic, uh, uh, demographic uh, 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 processes in the making of history, and there has been the Marxian tradition, the, the orthodox Marxian tradition, which emphasize, has emphasized the links between uh, socioeconomic context and, uh, and human behavior mediated through class. Uh, from the late 60s, however, there has been a very significant break from both these traditions through the work of another kind of radical social history, 
best typical, typified by radical uh, Marxist social history, best typified by E.P. Thompson, in my opinion. Uh, here, instead of determining uh, determination by structures, what Thompson and the Thompsonian tradition has emphasized is agency, uh, of particularly of plebeian groups struggling against the symbolic orders and the material structures and unities imposed by dominant classes. Such efforts have not been a mechanical reflex of class relations, but a conscious appropriation. And it is this dimension of agency that Thompson repeatedly emphasizes. This is, of course, very, very familiar, perhaps over-familiar. And I would like to add that the great thing about Thompson is that along with this very valid and valuable emphasis of agency, he has never forgotten about the importance of structures, about the objective determinants also. So he tries to bring out the interrelations between agency and structures. And that is the strength, and that is what makes Thompson remain a major Marxist historian. Uh, Thompsonian social history, however, came under, has come under a lot of criticisms also, which have to be taken seriously, particularly from the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, when a, a new cultural and linguistic turn developed in a lot of history writing. Here, in this tradition, which sometimes has been called post-social history, there is an enormous emphasis on language as an more or less autonomous medium of uh, uh, medium of communication. Its self-sufficiency, its constituent role, all that gets emphasized. Uh, this post-social turn has certainly contributed quite a bit, yet in some ways it, it is problematic. I must confess, as would be obvious already, both from those who have been seen a little bit of my work and certainly from what I said just now, that I remain an unregenerate Thompsonian in my historical approach. Even though I do recognize the force of some of the criticisms that have been made. There are silences in Thompson, troubling silences, particularly when I think about gender. And there is also an exclusive, uh, a somewhat excessive perhaps sometimes exclusive emphasis on moments of militancy. And that also raises problems. In, my, in the core of my presentation, I'll also talk about some similar problems that have come up in uh, the radical modes of Indian his history writing also. At the same time, the discursive turn, which sometimes seems to be carrying all before it, also has problems. Because what it tends to do is to replace uh, 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 material deter uh, determinations by linguistic determination. Agency, one in this mode also, can get somewhat marginalized uh, by getting uh, uh, reduced, collapsed into mere vectors of language. Now I'll pa pass on to uh, Tanika. Uh, who will be presenting, uh, reading out the rest of my paper, where I talk about mainly about about first of all about uh, the developments in Indian social history over time, and then about my own work. It would be helpful if I begin with a few peculiarities. I am reading Shume. Don't say that every time. <laughs> peculiarities in our historiography of the social. Quite an important segment uh, on the early work on social lives was actually done outside the professional discipline of history. Formal history writing in the modern disciplinary mode was something that came in during colonial times with British historians of India, and initially it had a very, very narrow political orientation. With some exceptions, the dominant concern, of course, was uh, empires and statecraft. And this provided, this uh, created a huge problem for patriotic Indian historians because the 
emphasis, especially on histories of British conquests and governance, could hardly stir the imagination, uh, hardly stir their imagination. And the progress and expansion of the colonial state was not something that they could identify with. Where then would colonized Indians find themselves in history? Rabindranath Tagore, in an essay of 1902, made a distinction between the realm of the state or rashtra and the realm of the social or samaj. He suggested, somewhat unfairly I think, that the West has excelled in the political realm, while real Indian genius lay in the construction of the social. The social was the domain where our significant histories happened and collective lives were most fully lived out. So while Western historians eagerly map the rise and fall of states, it would, said Tagore, make greater sense for Indian historians to concentrate on Samaj, to study society, culture, and religion. In this respect, a major impetus for patriotic historians to do history in these terms occurred with the Swadeshi movement of 1903-1908, the first popular anti-colonial upsurge against the partition of the province of Bengal. The offended pride of the middle class Bengali nationalists led them to produce discourses on their regional identity, primarily in terms of historical reconstructions of folk and local cultures. Sometimes these were purely antiquarian, but nonetheless, it's interesting that they unearthed, compiled, and used material that related to quotidian practices and activities to folk culture. Why the centrality of popular <coughs> culture in such reconstructions? This was because Bengal had never really been a major seat of high Hindu Brahmanical culture and Bengali scholars needed to turn to local popular traditions and social lives to celebrate the region's cultural creativity. A large range of local histories were therefore composed in the next few decades of districts, towns, villages, illustrious families, using family papers, local memories, and visible signs of material culture. One of them, Dinesh Chandra Sen, wrote about women's crafts, public and domestic architecture in <coughs> villages. Another, he also demonstrated the popular reach of Vaishnav religious sects by collecting religious manuscripts from village homes of low caste artisans and peasants. Another, Panchanan Mandal, collected thousands upon thousands of letters from village homes, uh, from ordinary people, from the late, uh, in the, uh, relating to the late 18th and uh, early 19th century, uh, touching on many aspects of social, domestic, and religious lives. These were problematic modes of writing. Very often they were marked by a rural romanticism, and little was said about problems of caste, landlordism, landless labor, women's labor. The village was portrayed as a natural organism, a site of idyllic harmony and shared culture. What remains interesting nonetheless is that certain kinds of everyday work and craft of ordinary experience were marked out as a legitimate field of historical research, however amateurishly done. Another interesting early area of historical writing that developed at this time were histories of local subcastes or jatis. As the colonial censuses began to enumerate local jatis and tried to record them according to their relative status, a number of jatis sought to claim a higher ritual status by collecting and publishing origin myths, local caste traditions, achievements of prominent caste members, and so on. They produced a curious mix, rereadings of older religious texts to find some reference to an older elevated status for their caste, as well as biographical fragments and associational activities, both old and new. What's interesting that is that histories of proper histories of caste which began from the 1990s, very late, now explore these writings with great curiosity and interest as important source materials. 
The first major breakthrough in formal social historiography came with the most outstanding of uh, historians of ancient India, the Marxist scholar D.D. Kosambi. As he wandered around the environs of his Pune residence and observed how, how common people wielded their instruments of work and suggested connections between past and present labor forms and crafts and their relations with the larger material cultures. A similar interest in the histories of the lived environment and material culture also animated the work of Niharanjan Ray, who wrote about ancient and early medieval Bengal. Unfortunately, however, the insights developed in the historiography of one particular period often did not inflect developments in studies of other periods. More seriously, there was a singular lack of communication between formal English language histories addressing an international or national readership and histories written in vernacular languages. I want to emphasize that I do not refer here to histories written in a vernacular idiom, but to formal, professional, academic histories that were written in regional languages. Historians on uh, these histories, moreover, were largely of Hindus. Historians on India, of Indian Islam and Muslims, on the other hand, for a long time, remained restricted to classical theological schools and to court cultures. This, however, changed from the 1980s, and now there is a profusion of significant studies of popular Muslim sects and reform movements, of seminaries and newspapers, of histories of print culture, Islamic print culture, Urdu literature, women's education, especially in 19th century North India. Marxist history, since Kosambi, in principle, should have led to a major breakthrough in the domain of social history, foregrounding lives of ordinary people. Studies of modes of exploitation and expropriation should have ideally woven political, social, and economic experiences together, especially among laboring people. However, till very recently, there was a prominence only of allegedly meaningful social categories like the industrial proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and of quote-unquote meaningful activities of workers like trade union, unionism and strikes to the exclusion of almost everything else. Unless social categories and activities were seen as harbingers of fundamental historical change in modes of production, or of revolutionary politics, especially of an anti-imperialist orientation, Marxist historians were not much interested. Moreover, a rather sterile notion of social formations came to constitute yet another problem. Predictably, a rigid determination of the superstructure by this base tended to predominant, uh, predominate and there were long and abstract debates about formal definitions of mode of production. The preoccupation with definitions proved remarkably unproductive, failing to yield accounts of lived social relations, even for social categories that were considered significant. The successive stages of social formation within an orthodox Marxist framework were regarded as universally valid, given, and fixed in their broad contours each stage transiting from one to the other with predictable regularity. Once the precise kind of social formation of any historical time and place was defined, one could easily, almost mechanically, predict its salient characteristics and future course. Another problem had been a rather narrow definition of material practices. The famous mode of production debates precluded interest in other forms of commodities and markets, of print technology, of film industry, or of markets of fashion or leisure commodities, for instance. Our state archives were opened up very late, and that created some of these problems. They opened up for the first time from the 1960s, and archival documents for colonial times were first used seriously by a group of historians largely located in Cambridge University. They developed closely focused studies of regional elites and of local patron-client networks. And they were 
they also collected a great deal of criticism for their utter indifference to broad political ideologies and movements of anti-colonial mass upsurges. The left nationalists who wrote about such movements in a really angry reaction against so-called Cambridge School historians provided, in turn, a rather heroic history of nationalist leaders who led equally heroic peasant masses. They did not develop a social history of the leadership, the peasantry, or of the interaction between the two. It was historians of the subaltern studies group from the late 70s who first developed highly textured and finely grained narratives of individual and specific popular struggles, struggles and movements, and their relations with the elite nationalist leadership and state agencies. The work of Ranajit Guha, Gautam Bhadra, David Arnold, David Hardiman, of Shahid Amin and Gyan Pandey, and to some extent my own studies during my brief stint within the group, related particular peasant and tribal struggles to local economies and to, post, uh, and to peasant tribal cultures. Changes in these relationships through the dynamics of struggles became their principle, almost their only focus of interest. They explored the culture and ideology of caste and religion as a grid through which subalterns interpreted nationalist messages in diverse and autonomous ways, often going beyond the control and regulation of nationalist, nationalist leaders. For the first time, too, uh, our historians interacted closely with post-structuralist social and cultural anthropology and linguistics. But soon, a sort of staleness uh, set in, as the studies remained confined to just one dominant theme, subaltern militancy, only and that too only in anti-colonial movements and its relationship with elite nationalists. They certainly made a very important point when they suggested that there was an inverse relationship between the strength of subaltern movements and of elite struggles. Subalterns could come into their own when the elite leadership weakened and vice versa. Once this point had been abundantly proved, the enterprise became merely repetitive. From late 80s and early 90s, there was a radical change in the mode of history writing among subaltern historians. It coincided with the discursive turn and the global efflorescence of post-colonial studies. In fact, Within the project, global scholarship, especially Edward Said's influence, proved the decisive inspiration. And Partho Chatterjee first internalized the new impulse within, within a revised idiom, subaltern studies idiom. Several crucial shifts occurred as a result. The political come socio-economic horizons in subaltern experience slowly receded into the background. The historians now turned to the elite nationalist middle class and to colonial discourses as the key actors in history, the real subjects. If subaltern figures survived in their works at all, they were rather romantically portrayed as bearers of an authentic culture, untainted by Western enlightenment, embodiments of colonial difference, as Partha Chatterjee put it. Their economic needs, their daily lives, their political struggles within and outside the domain of anti-national movements no longer commanded much interest. Nationalist elites too now came to be viewed entirely through a culturalist lens which bypassed their economic and political interests and activities. Middle class discourses were moreover explored only to locate signs of enlightenment knowledge that colonialism introduced. Enlightenment, rather reductively I think, was taken to be a monolithic body of intellectual influence whose internal stratifications and contestations seemed to need no unpacking. Its presence moreover was seen as all pervasive. If any trace or influence could be found in any Indian discourse, then this was taken to indicate Indian cultural surrender to the West. The fact that Indians could have absorbed Western knowledge through cultural grids of their own, filtering and reading them in the context of their own political needs and desires, 
and thereby subverting them at times was not a proposition that was entertained. In the same measure, earlier studies of structures of colonial exploitation and extractive mechanisms gave way to an exclusive cult concern with cultural imperialism or cultural colonization. It began to appear as if the British were in India for the sole purpose of colonial domination and for nothing else. Cultural domination. Cultural, cultural sorry, domination. cultural domination. <laughs> There were, however, some interesting variations. <laughs> cultural, <laughs> cultural domination. There were, however, some interesting variations on this overarching theme. Patho Chatterjee initially worked with a framework of derivative Indian discourses which borrowed their political and cultural language from post-enlightenment knowledge paradigms. Later, he introduced a new influence of, uh, sorry, new emphasis on colonial difference, a difference that the imagination of colonized Indians wrought into the original Western texts and political traditions. But the problem remained, whether the cultural exchange was defined as derivative or as one based on difference, what was lost were large areas of social and political experience of everyday aspects of Indian modernity and the ways in which different social groups created and recreated them through mutual conversations and arguments. In this ensemble, the colonial, the Western, the Enlightenment remain the constants, the ages, monolithic and unchanging. Till the late 1990s, this was the state of the art under the post-colonial accent of the cultural and the discursive the search for Western influence or for Indian authenticity. There were, however, important departures as well, especially in domains of histories of women, gender, and caste. I want to focus here on Indian labor histories, which came into their own from around this time, although some antecedents go back to early subaltern studies and to Marxism. Up to the 1980s, there were two dominant trends in the academic scholarship on Indian labor. One, best exemplified by Morris de Morris and his work on Bombay cotton textile industry had, quote unquote, a managerial bent. Morris studied questions of labor recruitment, the adaptation of Indian workers to the industrial work culture, the evolution of the mechanisms of labor discipline. The main purpose of Morris and of others like him was to explain the so-called deviance of Indian industrial patterns from the path charted by quote-unquote normal capitalist development. This was explained by a model of Indian, of, sorry, a model of insufficiencies of Indian workers and capitalists, an inefficient and volatile working class, a backward style of management. The second trend, largely leftist in orientation, concerned itself with the history of labor movements, focusing almost on organized trade unionism, strikes, and communist party leadership of working class struggles. This trend explained the ebbs and flows of labor militancy, usually in purely economistic terms in, or in terms of the majority or failure of the political leadership. These two central pre preoccupations took some time to change and to expand, especially since studies of urban labor remained quite a marginal area, and there was a reason for that. The political experiences of the 60s and 70s had been extremely crucial for radical historians the world over, Vietnam War, Cultural Revolution, May 68, and so on. The global revolutionary movements had an Indian counterpart. The cluster of armed peasant and tribal struggles against landlord and state in different parts of the subcontinent, known generic, generically as Nakshalbari or Maoist movements. They produced an explosion in peasant studies of different kinds, the early subalterns soon dominating the scene. In contrast, working class histories received scant attention. Uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti in the late 80s proved to be an exception to the dominant subalternist tra trajectory working on jute mill labor in colonial Bengal. In a paradoxical and interesting way, however, he sought to reestablish the paramountcy of a basically feudal peasant culture for modern urban working class politics. 
The pervasive emphasis on the experiential quality in class formation that E.P. Thompson's writings had introduced was important for Chakravarti. He moved away from the narrow economic determinism of Marxist, uh, earlier Marxist labor historians towards the cultural worlds of workers in cities and towns. And here he found the rural linkages of migrant workers to be decisive. He emphasized the crucial role of persistently pre-bourgeois, semi-feudal, hierarchical, cultural, and social structures, even when workers labored, uh, labored in urban factories. He explained their political forms in terms of their previous cultural mode, and therefore, in his account, workers shaped their political organization according to rural ties of deference and to their immersion in religious concerns. Middle class, class trade union <coughs> leaders coming to command their obedience only because of their superior class and education. This, Chakravarti said, largely replicated the ties of deference that had bound peasants to their rural bosses. It was then the patterns of pre-modern hierarchies and habits of deference of caste and community <coughs> bonds, of religion, which actually structured their relations of labor and their union organization. Colonialism had failed totally to create a hegemonic bourgeois culture or an authentic working class culture. Chakravarti's work remains of enduring significance. No historian of labor since then has been able to ignore the relationships among religion caste, class, and the patterns of difference and defiance that they bred. But there were strong challenges. In order to prove the non-modern character of the Indian worker, Chakrabarti argued that religion, rather communalism, ra rather than class, dictated working class action. And he showed how religious riots between Hindu and Muslim jute mill workers on days of contested religious festivals predominated over strikes on factory-related issues. Ranajit Dashgupta, a Marxist scholar, objected with very powerful counterexamples drawn from working class solidarity action, which he claimed outweighed instances of religious strife. The polemic was inconclusive, but quite productive. In the process of the debates, both historians managed to uncover large and important chunks of material on working class modes of religiosity as well as on militant trade union organization and strike action. Labor history really blossomed from mid and late 1990s, paradoxically at the very time when actual labor movements in our country seemed to enter a time of tragic and terminal <coughs> decline and factories all over India faced large-scale closures. Consequently, some of the binaries upon which the earlier labor history had rested, formal versus informal labor or traditional versus modern forms of work, now began to dissolve. As much of production turned home-based, shifting away from factories to casual labor and to informal employment patterns. Vanishing forms of labor and production, factories and working class mahallas or <coughs> living areas, now came to command a far more serious and nuanced attention. The massive researchers of late Rajnarayan Chandravarkar on the textile mills of Bombay, um, textile mill workers of Bombay between the late 18th, 19th century and the 1940s threw up some of the most important and influential insights of the new labor histories. He studied the cyclical pattern of workers' migration between the countryside and the city, the structure of the urban labor market, and the rhythms of worker mobilization within the shifting strategies deployed by capital in India, as it sought a leverage within the structural constraints that had been set on Indian industries by colonial domination. While most accounts of industrial labor had so far limited themselves to the world of the factory, Chandravarkar emphasized the centrality of neighborhoods, of street li life, of relations with local plebeian groups and bosses, showing how workers lived embedded within an amorphous and larger mass of poor and lower middle class people. All this 
uh, structured and define their life worlds, the possibilities and limits of their political action and mobilization. He also made a powerful critique of culturalist accounts such as Chakravarti's. He argued that in its emphasis on the rural-derived pre-bourgeois nature of working class life, Chakravarti's work had implicitly reasserted the polar opposition between the two that both Marxist orthodoxy and modernization theories had earlier insisted on. These disjunctions overshadow the extent to which workers' actions, according to Chandravarkar, were rational responses to material conditions of capitalist and state repression and to fluctuations in demands in labor market, in the labor market. He offered instead a flexible conjunctural explanation of working class consciousness and politics that was grounded in a version of the rational choice theory. He elaborated it in an argument, especially in an argument about the late 19th century outbreaks of the plague epidemic in Bombay and the response of the urban poor to the government's plague control measures. Rather than demonstrating a blind and total culturally rooted opposition to Western medicine, the working poor he showed responded in a diverse variety of ways. The movements of the moments of their violent resistance could be, he said, best explained by the arbitrary and insensitive nature of the colonial measures. And there is no need to invoke deep cultural differences as the deus ex machina of workers' action. The critique of culturalism is well substantiated. However, I seem to think that his over-reliance on a strong version of the rational choice theory bears some dangers of its own. If Chakravarti's workers are trapped within a pre-bourgeois hierarchical culture, Chandravarkar's workers are equally trapped within the more material determinants of the labor market, managerial authority and decisions and disciplinary mechanisms. Chitra Joshi's book on textile mill workers of Kanpur city in North India breaks free of these polarities and reductions in a remarkable manner. It is characterized by an enormous sensitivity towards the actual lived environments of workers, vividly invoking concrete ways of life, the lanes, the slums, the drains, the contrasting architecture of mills, managerial houses, workers' hovels, often with very evocative photographs. Her title, Lost Worlds, Indian Labor and Its Forgotten Histories, is particularly apposite, I think, since the book deals with many kinds of losses, of spaces, histories, solidarities. Workers come from villages to the city to seek work. They return to villages when they are old, unemployed, or ill. Within the city, they move from factory to factory, from regular to casual employment, from regulated to sweated work, <coughs> from jobs to joblessness. As she says, a factory worker today and a rickshaw puller tomorrow. Different and overlapping migrations and movements characterize these workers as they characterize workers of other industrial cities, once bastions of radical militancy and industrial production, now displaying closure, unemployment, smokeless factory chimneys, silent and deserted mills, casualization of work, breakdown of unions, and struggles for rights. Horizons of possibilities shrink as workers lose their identity as factory laborers. Working class memory plays a crucial role in her understanding of the linkages between workers' past and present. Their present experience of worklessness, for instance, reconfigures memories of past forms of factory work in complex ways. At the time when they actually were factory hands, so-called, Workers had experienced that work as pain, deprivation, injustice, and they had reacted with militant struggles against factory, against factory discipline. But that, in retrospect, was also a time of hope, solidarity, and organization. Their present loss of work reconfigures those times nostalgically now giving them an aura of worth and substance, despite the hard labor and the struggles. 
for both labor and struggle were possible then and are no longer available now. I come now to some aspects of my own writing. When I look back on the work that I did on 19th century Bengali middle class and lower middle class lives, culture, social relations, and religion, in the light of the recent labor history studies, I am struck by a very important omission. I was one of the first to underline, separate out, and focus on the urban lower middle classes as a distinct and different formation within the modern urban middle class. Semi-educated but often high caste men who were confined in the new printing press workshops or in government offices as low paid clerks and workers ruled by the discipline of the new clock time experiencing both work and family as a joyless compulsion and seeking out an inner religious life that would provide solace, escape, and a higher meaning, experiencing religion as living space. Before and after me, too, studies of the Bengali middle class has, have, uh, have continued to talk about the modern, advanced elite intelligentsia alone in terms of their thoughts, writings, and activism. But while I did introduce a new social category that was immensely important as consumers and even occasionally as producers of the culture of urban modernity, I did not write adequately at all about the precise quality of their work itself, what they did, exactly what were their wages and terms of employment, their internal hierarchies and their relations with the overall structure of management and workplace. Perhaps this too was a product of the, materials, of the culturalist term. Nonetheless, there were important thematic concerns. I refuse to see modern social and cultural lives of Indians as bifurcated necessarily and always between Western influence and Indian surrender or resistance to them. To it, in their response to modern times, Indians often selectively used diverse categories of Western discourses, but I insist these were always received through their and transformed through their own cultural traditions, lived experiences, and conversations. There was considerable autonomy and revisioning in that reception. Moreover, very large and crucial areas of social relations were remade in complex ways that lay outside the parameters of influence resistance paradigm that post colonial scholars are so attached to. Finally, I choose to see the middle classes, as I just said, not as a single undifferentiated category. I focused instead on the multiple and overlapping social ideological layers, their internal relationships and their interactions with other social groups, non-middle class and with the state agencies. Methodologically, I was deeply influenced by traditions of microhistory and by German histories of everyday lives, by uh, Carlo Ginsberg, Med uh, Hans Medic, and Alf Lutke, among many others. I chose to enter broad historical processes through a bounded, specific, but strange event. The advantage was that an event would be a place where different and plural processes interact and unfold and they provide a point of entry into entangled worlds that are not otherwise possible to see in their mutual exchanges if we focus on a specific theme. A strange event, moreover, takes us to sources and to happenings <coughs> that often lie undiscovered or silenced in the archives until the violent jolt that they create by their strangeness on their surroundings suddenly throws up onto our attention, new and unexpected social categories, modes of interactions, new kinds of historical and archival documents. I'll take up here two such strange events that I explored, one being textual and the other both a crime and a religious cult. In both diverse social categories, rural and urban, high and low caste and class, men and women come together, collaborate and collide, who would otherwise have been kept apart and studied in separate compartments. 
Let me then talk a bit about these events and how I came to read them, for so far few of our historians had tried to focus on these small ordinary hap or extraordinary happenings. A major exception would be Ranajit Guha's study of a case of a failed abortion and death of a low-caste Bengali widow in the 19th century, Chandra's death. Otherwise, our historians have tended to focus on events that come out of histories of national importance. Shahid Amin's study of the Chauri Chaura riots, for instance, or Partho Chatterjee's study of an early 20th century scandal, which he designated as the secret history of nationalism. When I reversed the flow, a number of leftist, uh, leftist critics were surprised. And they questioned the relevance of studying matters that did not leave behind wide repercussions or prove to be agents or symptoms of broad historical change. The first event was a small local scandal. It unfolded in a village called Daihata in East Bengal in 1904. Daihata is located in Bikrampur subdivision, which at that time was renowned as a progressive, prosperous place, the seat of the new British education, and of a highly educated, modern, liberal, upper caste gentry. Here, Lal Mohan, a respectable, educated, upper caste householder, came to be closely associated with two low caste men, uneducated, Prashanna and Ananda, who shared his secret faith in a personalized cult. They believed that the Kali Yuga, the fourth final and the most corrupt epoch in the four-stage time cycle in Hindu mythology was at hand, and their cultic action would usher in a new cycle, beginning with a golden age. Kali Yuga is seen by Hindus as the epoch when evil reigns rampant, and women and low castes get on top of upper castes and men, inverting the normal caste gender order. Kalki Avatar, an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, preserver of creation, appears at its climax to destroy evil and to reinstall normal hierarchies and initiate a new four-age cycle. Lal Mohan and his associates believed that they knew the formula for the end of Kali Yuga. The disciples were let into his, Lal Mohan's household one night and they were given free reign to perform the ritual sequence which they thought would terminate Kali Yuga and end the cycle of death and rebirth for all the participants, the cycle of karma. The association between high and low castes and their entry into the respectable household were so, are so unconventional as to be unheard of. But what followed was enormously more cataclysmic. According to the ritual sequence that they had devised, Lal Mohan's wife was ordered to strip and kick on the forehead of her husband to urinate on his body. The husband lay prone, offering up his face and body to her, denoting a spectacular inversion of the normal act of obeisance when the wife lies on the ground and worships her husband's feet. It was also a liminal act, denoting the temporary suspension of gender and caste norms. Of course, inversion was symbolic, not real, as the wife was commanded to perform a series of acts that were as humiliating and degrading for her as they were for her husband. Ananda was then ritually killed, and he faced his death with calmness, with the conviction that this would give him a new golden body. When the police came and captured Prashanna, the other low-caste disciple, he shouted that all the soldiers of the British Empire would not be able to hold him down, as he knew that a new age had dawned. At the court trial, when he was asked to write his name, he replied that had he known how to write, he would have been a rich man. He clearly believed that for a subaltern like him, the ritual sequence was the only mode of release not just from social inferiority, but also from the bonds of temporal life itself. This was a belief that was shared by the educated and prosperous upper caste man. But for him, deliverance from the cycle of rebirth would have been the dominant concern.
Newspapers did report on this incident, albeit briefly and embarrassedly, and there was a pamphlet that gave a more elaborate account. Clearly, to educated upper caste locals of Bikrampur, proud of their reputation for modern and good sense, this was a highly compromising episode. And they would do no more than record a fact that was too violent, too scandalous to be ignored totally, but also a fact that could not be elaborated or analyzed either. But for these two minimal sources, we would not have come across the strange underbelly of high caste rights, myths, and beliefs. The undercurrents, the occasional cataclysmic rupturing of the normal and the acceptable take us to an obscure liminal secret world that remains otherwise hidden in normal times and does not appear on the archival files. A history of transgression, though only sporadic, unsystematic, and discontinuous, is thereby disclosed. And I think Partha Chatterjee's neat binary division between the modern bourgeois civil society and the domain of unruly indigenous popular politics thereby gets blurred, if not undermined altogether. Now the second, text, uh, the second event, the textual event, the creation of Ramakrishna Kathamrita, a collection of daily sayings of the great 19th century Bengali saint Ramakrishna Paramhansa. It may appear strange that I describe middle class interactions with Ramakrishna as, a, <coughs> as an extraordinary or a strange, uh, uh, sorry, uh, strange. <laughs> strange encounter. Ramakrishna is one of the best known figures of 19th century Bengal, a saint with a huge and illustrious following. He is regarded as a maker of mainstream middle class Hindu devotion. Yet there are some extraordinary aspects to this connection. He was, in his early life, a virtually illiterate village priest with no knowledge of English. Indeed, he remains so all his life, illiterate and not at all English educated, not modern. His devotees, however, came principally from the ranks of highly educated men in Calcutta. He preached a, a message of quiet devotion, aiming to provide solace which impressed not only the intelligentsia, but also lesser urban men leading petty or lower middle class lives drawn into what they felt was a highly oppressive and tedious working existence in clerical jobs in government or business offices. This was the world of chakri or waged employment, which became in Ramakrishna's telling the heart of darkness and the focal point of Kali Yuga. Why should regular waged work be described as the worst kind of suffering and evil? There's a reason. The clerks who came to provide the bulk of his devotees were by no means desperately poor. Certainly, they were better off than most peasants, artisans, or factory workers of their time. They were upper caste men and enjoyed a measure of social status and security. However, most of them came from rural small holding or had urban impoverished bourgeois roots, which meant that they were unused to working on a daily basis un under rather impersonal superiors. The very experience of subordination and confinement in office, subordination to the hierarchies, to the command and control of foreign employers entail tedium and humiliation. Here, etymology might be of some relevance. Chakri is associated with the word, word chakra, which means servant. Among this urban fraction, complaints about domestic life and about the demands made by nagging wives upon a supposedly beleaguered male breadwinner were rife. These complaints have been portrayed richly in bazaar paintings and in contemporary satires and plays of the 19th century. Ramakrishna's teaching gave this complaint a coherent, fo a coherent form and the shape of an explanation of social disorder. He suggested that Chakri and women were closely related, for it was the expenses of maintaining wives and households that pushed men into the bondage of service, sapping their vitality. 
The sense of bondage and subordination resonated with anxieties, then very common in lower middle class Bengal, about the loss of manhood. The mythological concept of Kali Yuga too had projected images of epochal and social <coughs> catastrophe, with the figures of the woman and the low caste now supposedly dominating upper caste men. Interestingly, Ramakrishna made some occasional references to the especial humiliation of being subjects of a British queen, yoking together several different perceived sources of resentment. The new educational dispensation of schools and colleges, again regulated by the clock, intensified the power of the theme among a wider category of modern students. For Ramakrishna, this work discipline too was a constitutive element of the Kali Yuga. He offered a very specific form of devotion to counteract this. Unlike most kinds of organized pieties, this was not based on formal texts or rituals. It precluded miracles and did not preach any abandonment of the cares of the world. It offered instead a form of this worldly piety. But it was very different, too, from the Puritan emphasis on work within the world as a form of calling. Ramakrishna very bluntly advised his devotees that they should stay in the world only because that was essential for livelihood. Wives and families were also were necessary to look after their daily needs, but they were to regard work and family as evils, things of minor concern. This was an eminently prosaic devotion offering practical advice. So Chakri, clock time, anxieties about the loss of manhood were given a coherence by the explanatory framework of Kali Yuga. Ramakrishna's devotionalism offered a way of negotiating the many woes of the new urban petty middle classes. It offered the possibility of the continued material security that work and household pro provided, and also a means of dealing with the resentment provoked by the experiences of everyday life. It created an inner living space of devotion as excess. And this fitted in with the well-established notion that their devotion provided the easy path, Sahaja, in Kali Yuga meant it was often said by old sacred scripture were diminished in all their powers during Kali Yuga and a simpler path to salvation was therefore now required that was free of earlier onerous sacrifice or hard spiritual labor and this is the path that Ramakrishna provided. There was something else that was strange and new. Ramakrishna spoke in an easy rural and folk idiom using metaphors and symbols from everyday rural life, from worlds of rural work and worlds of rural women. But he spoke not to rural folk, but to eminently successful city men and to lower middle class men as well. He was himself attracted by the novelties, quite frankly so, attracted by the novelties of modern urban life, theater, circus, new intellectual and social reform work. He sought out important urban luminaries and tried to develop close contacts with them. But what is much more important is that they too came to him in considerable numbers and sometimes abdicated their stern intellectual rationalism to embrace his easy and simple faith. This makes us once again revise our notion of a segregated high and rational modernity, uncluttered by anything archaic or obscure. It is clear that the modern intelligentsia was, at this point, tired of its demanding intellectual and reform activity. The hopes of earlier liberalism had come to nothing much, and the hopes of nationalist anti-colonial activism were still in the future. Ramakrishna's relations with prominent urban intellectuals thus capture a hiatus in the history of our intelligentsia, a strange history that scholars like Parthu Chatterjee have overlooked in their clear-cut distinctions between the civil and the popular. I hope, therefore, to practice social history writing by probing such small and unexpected events as a mode of estrangement. 
we need to move away somewhat, I think, from an exclusive focus on grand themes that have captivated our historians for so long and so obsessively. Peasant and tribal nationalism, nationalist leaders, working class tribes, elite discourses. Or rather, to put it better, we need to reframe these grand themes within other stories of a different kind, which have other, more obscure characters. Not only would this provide us with new historical figures, but the better known historical actors too will take on new meanings when they are seen in interaction with them. In all this language, discourse of many different people remain central, but only as an indivisible, integral part of the social world, of class relations, of forms of labor, and of forms of extraction and expropriation, and of other social identities. In this sense, my framework remains embedded within a revised form of Marxism and in a revised version of social history.